All right, guys, welcome. Welcome to Products That Count. So excited for you guys to be here. Second event. Woo! All right. Woo! Um, how many here were, what, uh, how many of you guys came to the last event last month? Not bad, not bad. Awesome. How many of you have heard of Products That Count? Well, sorry, before this event. My bad. I walked right into that. Before this event, how many of you have heard it about Products That Count before? Okay, makes sense. So let me talk a little bit about Products That Count. So I'm Andrea Chesley. I head up the New York City chapter of Products That Count. Uh, Products That Count is about 17,000 now. Uh, uh, community of product managers, entrepreneurs, uh, innovators. And what we, what we are is really just, again, a wealth of programs for, for, for product managers and um, at thought, thought leaders, et cetera. Um, we have events like these, so speaker series. We also have a lot of rich content, so if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please do. Uh, we also have a wonderful podcast, so we have great, great um, 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 people that we interview uh, by SC, who's our founder. And just, again, the, the best thing for, for us here is, again, I'm going to mention again the speaker series because it provides you guys with not just the wonderful speakers that we have, high caliber, but also a, a chance to network and talk to like-minded people like yourselves. So that's products that count. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I'm very, very excited about, I would like to thank DigitalOcean, as always, who just, again, just hosting us in this beautiful space and also providing the very cute sandwiches. I've told, everybody's been told that uh, the sandwiches we described as cute and wonderful. Um, again, thank you so much, DigitalOcean. I also want to introduce our, their head of product, which is Shivan Ramji, to say a few words and what's going on at DigitalOcean right now. Thank you. Welcome, how's everybody doing today? What is the ener New York energy? Come on. There we go, there we go. All right, well, thank you for coming to a beautiful space. Um, we are located in this building. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this space. Um, and we're also very excited and happy to host products uh, that count. Um, this is the second event. And just to build on what Andrea said, um, I've been in the product community here for a while, for many, many years, and never found a meetup that really uh, was made sense for product people, especially if you're a growing community. And um, uh, I think Products That Count is doing something really interesting. Uh, and so I hope uh, many of you come back if you are building careers in product management. Um, and just a little bit, and um, just wanted to share a little bit about what we do at DigitalOcean. We're essentially a simple platform to enable developers build um, great software in the cloud. Uh, we just hit so, one million customers uh, recently, and so thank you. Um, uh, and that means that the team is growing, so we're hiring in product uh, management roles, in product design, and engineering roles too. So if any of you are interested in learning more, there are some members of our product design team there uh, in the uh, DigitalOcean hoodies and t-shirts. Uh, if you want to talk about product management, feel free to uh, come talk to me whenever we have a break. And enjoy uh, a great speaker. Next. So our speaker for tonight is Nir Eyal. So if you guys have not yet read his book, Hooked, you should. As product managers, um, we're always trying to strive to build that super sticky, super engaging, habit-forming product. And personally, just having read Nir's book, definitely very inspiring. Um, my entire team is actually reading this book right now. So again, that just is a testament to how inspiring this is. Uh, Nir, Nir is also uh, an educator and an entrepreneur. But again, like I said, read his book, absolutely amazing. And we're super, super excited to have him speak tonight. Nir, welcome. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here today because uh, up until recently when I was in New York, I was a visitor. Now I'm officially a resident. I'm really in New York. Thank you. Uh, 
I left Silicon Valley. I lived in Silicon Valley for the past 11 years, and uh, I used to live in Manhattan, and then I, I, I had to come back because I, I missed it. My wife missed it. We're raising our kid here, so we are really excited to be part of the tech scene here in New York. It's so awesome to see how vibrant it is. When we left in 2006, just starting to get just started. This is when Facebook first was getting going, and there wasn't really much of the tech scene here, and now it's just so awesome to see so many people uh, in this community. So with that, let's get started. Um, about, about. Let's, let's talk, talk about. about. Nope, doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Aha. Let's talk about habits. So, so, so one, one thing that we've all seen over the past several years is that these devices that we carry around, yeah, a little bit louder. Little bit louder. Okay. okay, let me do that. How about now? Is that better? A little bit better? A little bit? Okay, I'll try and project. Uh, so there's one thing we've seen is that these devices that we all carry around with us, they have a profound impact on our day-to-day -day lives, on our day-to-day -day behaviors. And so what I've tried to do over the past several years is to understand what it is about these companies that allow these products that at first start as toys, as nice-to-haves, as these products that everybody dismissed when you first saw them, what makes these products Things that within the span of a few short years, maybe five to ten years, are used by hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people, and are making these companies hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. So when I talk about these kind of companies, these companies that were easily dismissed at first, who comes to mind? What, what kind of companies pop to mind? Think of the last five to ten years. Who comes to mind? Pinterest. Pinterest. Great example. They're growing like crazy. What else? Who else? Facebook, of course. Facebook is usually the one or two uh, uh, companies first mentioned. But this $500 billion behemoth, the first time you saw Facebook, did you really think it would be as massive as it is today? Touching one in seven people on the face of the earth and growing every single day. Unbelievable. Who else? Slack. Slack, the fastest growing enterprise company in history. Right? Who else? Twitter. Twitter? Sure. Yeah. Maybe Snapchat. There's lots of other companies. Instagram, I think you could put that in category. WhatsApp. Lots of these companies have somehow come out of nowhere, all of them easily dismissed at first, and yet have had such a profound global impact. How do they do it? And so that was my, my key question. So what I wanted to understand was the patterns behind how these companies change consumer behavior so profoundly and so quickly so that all of us, no matter what product we're working on, can learn from these design patterns and integrate those design patterns into our products as well. That's my goal behind my research. Now, I compiled what I learned inside this book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. Um, if you haven't read the book, I, I recommend it. It costs $14 on Amazon. If you don't have $14, that's fine. I can tell you where to go. Get it for free online. Go pirate it somewhere. I don't care. <laughs> right? I already got my advance. I just want you to read it. <laughs> So um, we're not going to be able to cover everything in the book, obviously. There's a lot more examples, a lot more research that we're going to have time for today. But I want to give you kind of a high-level overview of the three years of research I did into how these products change our day-to-day -day habits. Now, the book came out of a class that I taught at a design school at Stanford. And I do a lot of corporate workshops and consulting around this subject matter as well. So let's dive right in with the definition of a habit. When we use this term, habit, what do we mean? Now, so the definition of a habit is a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. It's about half of what you do every single day is done purely out of habit. These behaviors done with little or no conscious thought. And I believe that we are on the precipice of an age where we can use these habits for good, where we can help people live happier, healthier, uh, more productive, more connected lives by using these habits for good. You know, I don't teach and consult to the gaming companies and Facebook and Twitter. They don't need my help, right? They already know these techniques. My goal is to take those techniques that have been proven to have such a profound impact on people's lives and disseminate these methods so that all of us, whether you're working on an app to help people exercise more or save money or be more productive at work or stay connected with each other, we can use these habits for good. And that's really why I do the work that I do. So let's dive in. What I've found in my research is that all of these products that we talked about, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Slack, WhatsApp, all of these products fundamentally in their core have what's called a hook in the user experience. It's a key part of the user experience. Now a hook is defined as an experience to connect the user's problem 
with the company's product, with the solution, with enough frequency to form a habit. Okay, connecting the consumer's problem, the user's problem, with the company's product, with enough frequency to form a habit. Now this word frequency is a really big deal because what we find is that there must be sufficient frequency or there is no chance of changing a consumer habit. Okay? The more frequently a person engages with a product, the more likely they are to change that consumer habit. So when you think about the habit forming potential of these devices, if you think about it, how often do people check the products that we talked about earlier? Slack, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook. How often do people check these products? All day, right? They're intraday habits. The stats are telling us that people check their home screen on their phone on average 150 times per day. So super high habit forming potential when we're all carrying around these devices in our pockets. The more frequently we use a product, the more likely we are to change consumer behavior. Now, the second thing we know from good research about habit design is that there is a precipitous drop off in the likelihood that you will be able to change a consumer habit if the behavior does not occur within a week's time or less. Okay? It's a very important thing to remember. If you are designing a product or service that requires a habit, you have to get the user to do that key behavior within a week's time or less. Very, very difficult to change a consumer habit if the behavior does not occur at least within a week's time or less. There are some ways to do that. We can also bolt on habit forming behaviors onto products that don't occur frequently enough, but that's a really, really important uh, baseline to set, that you have to have this product be used enough uh, within a week's time or less. Now we can talk about what do you do if you have a product that is not used that frequently. For example, let's say your product is insurance. Okay? You know, Geico, when you buy your insurance, you don't use Geico insurance once a week. Right? You buy it once, you don't use insurance for your car, for your apartment, unless something terrible happens. So that will never be a habit-forming product. Now, if somebody wants, uh, later on, uh, when we do the q and I'm happy to talk about what do you do if you have a product that just is not used with that kind of frequency. We can talk about that. There's some techniques for what you do. But for the remainder of the presentation, let's focus on these kind of products that require, where the business model necessitates using the product within a week's time or less. If you think about it, Every one of the products we just talked about, Facebook, Twitter, Slack, Instagram, every single one of those products requires a habit or they go out of business. It is an existential threat to these companies if you lose your habit. Why? Because Facebook can't afford to spend money on advertising to get you to come back. You have to trigger yourself to come back to these products or they go out of business. Okay. The business model requires it. And it's not that every business has to be habit forming. Let me be very clear. Lots of businesses can make money, can be, do, do very good things for their customers, for their stakeholders, for their employees without forming a habit. It's just that every company that needs a habit has to have a hook. Okay? So let's dive into what are the key components of a hook. A hook has four basic parts, a trigger, an action, a reward, and finally an investment. So I'm going to walk you through these very quickly, kind of give you the 300,000 foot view. I'm sorry, the 30,000 foot view. Added one zero too many for some reason. Uh, so that you can kind of get a basic understanding of what these hooks look like. So let's dive into triggers. Triggers are things that tell the user what to do next. And there are two types of triggers. First are the external triggers. Now these, these are the kind of triggers that you know and love. For those of you who build products every day, like I used to in my last two companies, triggers are what tell the user the next action to take. Click here, buy now, play this. Some piece of information is inside the trigger to tell the user what to do. Okay? We all know and love these kind of external triggers. We see them every day as consumers. This is our craft as product designers. But what product people don't think about enough, and what turns out to be absolutely critical to forming these long-term habits, is creating an association with what's called an internal trigger. An internal trigger is something that tells the user what to do next, but that information for what to do is stored as a memory or an association inside the user's brain. So what we do when we're in a particular situation, partaking in a routine in a certain place around certain people, and most frequently when we experience certain emotions, tells us what to do next. 
with little or no conscious thought. Now, the most frequent internal triggers are these emotions, but not just any emotion. They are specifically negative emotions, negative emotions. What we do when we're feeling lost, or bored, or indecisive, or fatigued, or lonely, what we do when we experience these negative emotions prompts us to action, prompts us to look for our devices, because our devices provide relief. Listen, there is only one reason that you use any product or service. Any product or service. You know what that one reason is? To modulate your mood. That's it to make you feel something different. Everything we use commercially is used to make us feel something different. Okay? Don't believe me, let me tell you about a study that uh, was published a few years ago that really illustrates this point. We know that people suffering from depression check email more. I just saw three people put away their cell phones. <laughs> What's going on there? Why do people suffering from depression check email more? What's going on here? Well, it turns out that people suffering from depression experience what psychologists call negative valence states. They feel down more often than the rest of the population. What are they doing to boost their mood to get out of that negative valence state? Guess what they do? They go on their devices. They check email. They check the web more often than the rest of the population because they feel those negative valence states more often than the rest of the population. But if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this, right? We do this all the time. You don't have to be depressed to use these internal triggers to prompt you to action, these negative valence states. Let me ask you, what website or app do we check when we're feeling lonely? Where do we go? We check Facebook. Some people say Tinder, also true. <laughs> all right, different kind of loneliness, but same, same internal trigger. What about when we're feeling unsure before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer? What are we doing? We're Googling it. And what about when we're feeling bored, you know, between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't feel like working on? You check YouTube, you check Reddit, you check stock prices, you see what stupid thing Donald Trump said today. You look at all of these sites and applications and, and, and uh, apps to relieve you of this painful internal trigger, this negative valence state of boredom. Right? It's fundamentally boredom. And before we even understand why we're using these products, we're already online. We're already engaging with them. So what does this mean? How do we design products and services that can enhance people's lives, that can help them live better by using this understanding of internal triggers? Well, what it comes down to is if you are building a product that requires a habit, that requires people to come back on their own, you have got to be able to articulate what is that frequently occurring itch. What's that internal trigger that every time the user feels, you are the source of relief. That's what every single one of these companies that we described earlier does. They all attach to some frequently occurring itch, some negative valence state that when the user feels, subconsciously, they're using these, these products to relieve that pain point. Now, some people say, well, that's so, that's so sad, right? That's so pessimistic. Why can't it be about positive emotions, right? Sharing. Isn't sharing a positive emotion? Well, not really. Let me give you a, a quick illustration of why you have to focus on pain when you build products. I was on a flight recently across the country, and uh, I was sitting in the, in the aisle seat, and right across the aisle was this other guy who was asleep. And the flight attendant comes by, and the flight attendant asks this guy, she, he says, sir. And he doesn't wake up. So the flight attendant asks again, sir. Finally, he kind of screams, he says, sir. And the guy wakes up, right? Clearly, he had his blanket all the way up here, kind of suddenly wakes up. He says, sir, what would you like to drink? <laughs> right? You, you, <laughs> he says, I hate that. Right, they always do that. Why is that so annoying? Is there a need there? Yeah, absolutely there's a need. He, that gentleman probably would like a drink at some point, but not right now, <laughs> right? So the idea here that I want to get across is that you have to find when your user actually has that pain point or leave them alone. If there's no pain, if the guy wasn't thirsty right then and there, if he was perfectly comfortable sleeping away, then don't, he shouldn't be bothered. Right? So we've got to be able to reach out to people when they experience that pain point. And that's why it's so important to send external triggers as close as possible to when the user feels the internal trigger. 
A lot of times I get this question around, you know, how do we make sure that we send external triggers, notifications, messages that don't feel like spam, right? How do we make sure we don't send too many notifications? The difference between a notification that feels like spam and one that feels like magic is one word. That one word is context, context. The closer together you can couple the moment in time when the user feels the internal trigger with the moment in time you deliver that external trigger, that's when it feels like magic. So stop sending notifications and emails and messages to bother the user on your schedule. Start thinking about when is the internal trigger, when do they experience that internal trigger, and that's when we want to provide that message. That's when we want to send that external trigger. And there's so much data out there to allow us to do that, right? There's calendar information, there's location information, there's so much data that's readily accessible that we can use to properly trigger people, okay? So we talked about, uh, you know, let's talk about Instagram real quick. Why not? How many of you are Instagram users? Raise your hand for me. Oh, almost everybody. Terrific. What makes Instagram such a habit-forming product? Well, let's first talk about Instagram's external triggers. Where, do you first, where did you first hear about Instagram? Where, 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 how did you first hear about it? From friends, right? You post, somebody posted a photo to Facebook or to uh, Twitter, perhaps. And each one of those posts on, uh, on one of these sites had a big, fat external trigger that said, hey, check out my photo on Instagram, right? Tells you what to do next. You install the app. Now you have your, the app on your home screen. That's an example of an external trigger. And you start getting notifications, right, from your friends that tell you every time something happens to one of your friends on Instagram, open the app, see what's going on. Those are all examples of external triggers. Now let's talk about Instagram's internal triggers. Did, did you say you use Instagram? Oh, yeah. Your name is Angelica, right? What was the last thing you took a picture of with Instagram, if it's suitable for work? Um, oh, uh, a New York skyline. New York skyline, <laughs> terrific. So the New York skyline did not yell out to Angelica, Angelica, take a picture of me with Instagram. Right? There was no information telling Angelica what to do. So why did she do it? Well, when she saw this beautiful skyline, she had this instantaneous fear that she might lose this moment in time. <laughs> right? She wanted to capture this moment. Now, what other company, think about in the photography space 20, 30 years ago, what other company used to be about capturing the moment? Kodak. Kodak right? Does everybody remember the Kodak moment? Right? Kodak spent a hundred years and billions of dollars of advertising. Do you remember these commercials they used to run? Right? Many of you were kids when, when, when they ran these commercials on TV. The puppy dogs running through the grass. The kids who would someday leave the empty nest. They always had this one commercial, my favorite, the super schmaltzy commercial of the grandma blowing out her last birthday candles. <laughs> right? I'm not making up. You know which commercial I'm talking about. Why did Kodak spend billions of dollars in advertising to teach people about the Kodak moment? Well, they wanted to create this association in users' minds, in consumers' minds, that when you see a moment like this in your life, capture that moment with a Kodak camera before it disappears forever. Now, Instagram did, in 12 months, I'm sorry, in 18 months with 12 people, they did what took Kodak 100 years and billions of dollars in advertising to do by teaching us users what the Instagram moment is all about. But Instagram does much more than the Kodak camera ever could because Instagram is also a social network. So the more we use a product like Instagram, the more we begin to associate it with other internal triggers. It's not just about the fear of losing the moment. The more we go through the Instagram hook, we begin to associate it with other things. Like when we're feeling bored or lonely or FOMO. What's FOMO? Fear of missing out. Do you know it's actually a real word in the dictionary as of two years ago? <laughs> FOMO is officially a word in the English language. FOMO is a negative valence state. The fear of missing out feels bad. We don't like that sensation. And to relieve that negative valence state, we turn to, our, to this device found in our pockets. And Instagram wins. So that's a little bit about the importance of internal triggers and external triggers. Let's move on to the next step of the hook, the action phase. The action phase of the hook is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The smallest, simplest thing the user can do to get immediate relief from that internal trigger, from that negative valence state. Okay? Let me show you some examples of a few habit-forming products, and I want you to see just how simple this key action is. For example, a scroll on Pinterest, okay? or a search on Google. Or what could be simpler than just pushing the play button on YouTube? 
these incredibly simple actions done in anticipation of an immediate reward. Well, it turns out that there is a formula to help us predict the likelihood of these singular behaviors. It comes to us from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg. How many of you have seen this before? Nobody? A couple people. Okay, terrific, terrific. This is a very powerful formula in a product development context because what Fogg is telling us that for any human behavior, online, offline, doesn't matter, any human behavior as represented by B, we need three things. We need sufficient motivation. We need sufficient ability. Ability is how easy or hard something is to do. And the T stands for trigger. We just talked all about triggers. So any human behavior requires motivation, ability, and a trigger. That's all you need for any human behavior. Now, let's break this down a little bit. We talked about triggers. Let's talk about motivation and ability. Motivation is defined as the energy for action, how much we want to do a particular behavior. And, and Fogg tells us that there's these six key levers of motivation, that all of us, as human beings, we seek pleasure, we avoid pain. We seek hope, we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance, and we avoid social rejection. Now, there's a lot more to be said about motivation, but for the sake of time, I want to move on to the second part of B equals M-A-T. The A stands for ability. Okay? Now, ability is the capacity to do a particular behavior, how easy or difficult something is to do. And the easier something is to do, the more likely people are to do it. Okay? And here again, we have these six levers that we can pull on to make a behavior more likely to occur based on how much time something takes, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is required. Brain cycles, this is a big one when it comes to technology products, because the harder something is to understand, the less likely that behavior is to occur. Okay? Now, social deviance says that we become more likely to do something when we see other people like us doing it. And finally, non-routine says that we become more likely to do something simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past. And this is why habits are such a big deal. Because the more we do a particular behavior, the easier it becomes and the more likely we are to do it again in the future. What do we call that? It's called practice. The more we do it, the easier it becomes, the more likely we are to do it again in the future. So we can actually chart out these three basic elements of motivation, ability, and triggers on this conceptual graph. And if you go back to your product teams and you're struggling with this beautiful new app that you've built or this amazing new website, and damn it, people aren't doing the thing you want them to do. They're not clicking, they're not progressing, they're not checking out. Whatever action they're not doing, all you have to do is ask yourself, does the user have sufficient motivation? High motivation, low motivation. Then does the user have sufficient ability? If something is easy to do, it's way over here on the right. High ability, easy to do. If something is difficult to do, it's over here on the left. If the user has sufficient motivation and sufficient ability, when a trigger is present, this red threshold is crossed, and the behavior will occur every single time. Let's make this concrete. I want to show you an example. Think of the last time that a telephone rang. OK, phone rang in your life. Tell me why you didn't pick up the phone. Just give me the reason. Why didn't you pick up the phone? Too far away. What's that? Too far away, terrific. Okay, you're in the shower or you're, uh, you're in this uh, talk right now. The phone rings across the room. You lack ability, even if you have high motivation. It's too far away. It's too difficult. You don't want to be the one person in my talk that gets up and says, oh, I got to take this call right now. It's hard to do. So on this graph, even if you have high motivation, you have low ability. This zone up here is called frustration, right? High motivation, low ability. It's hard to do. You don't cross that, th that threshold, and the behavior does not occur. What's another reason that has to do with either ability or a trigger why you didn't pick up the phone? You don't know who's calling. Maybe it's an unknown number. Maybe it's somebody you don't want to talk to, right? You heard the phone ring, so the trigger was present. The phone was right there next to you. Now you have high ability. The phone's right there, and you heard it ring. But you lack ability. I'm sorry, you lack motivation. Why? Because you didn't want to talk to the person. Right? It's, you think it's a solicitor, it's an unknown number. You lack motivation, even if it's very easy to do and you heard the trigger. What's one more reason that has to do with the trigger why you may not pick up a call? Should have just texted you. They should have texted you? <laughs> but why, why didn't you pick up the call? The phone rings, but you're missing it. You didn't hear it, exactly. Right? This happens to me all the time. 
I was waiting for a call. I had high motivation. The phone was right there next to me, high ability, but the damn phone was on silent. Right? No trigger was present. So for every human behavior, your behavior, your significant other's behavior, your kid's behavior, your customer or user's behavior, every behavior requires these three basic elements. If the user isn't doing the behavior, it's only one of these three things. They lack motivation, it's too difficult because they lack ability, or the trigger isn't present. Okay? All right. Very brief introduction. I'm trying to keep it short so we can get to lots of Q&A. Let's move on to the next step of the hook the reward phase. The reward phase is where the customer's itch is scratched, okay? where they are provided some relief from that internal trigger we talked about earlier. Now, when we talk about rewards, we have to start in the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain that we call the nucleus accumbens. Now, the nucleus accumbens was first studied by two Canadian researchers by the name of Olds and Milner in the 1940s. And Olds and Milner's experiments involved taking an electrode and inserting it inside the brain of lab animals, particularly in this zone that we call the nucleus accumbens. And here's what they discovered. They discovered that when they implanted this electrode and allowed the lab animals to stimulate the nucleus accumbens with a little lever that they could press on, what they discovered was that the lab animals wanted to do nothing but activate this part of the brain. They would run across painful electrified grids they would forgo food and water just to continue to activate this part of the brain again and again and again. In later experiments done on people, when people were given a little button to press on, and every time they pressed on this button, they would receive an electrical jolt to their nucleus accumbens, they observed similar results. Some people in these studies had to have the machines forcibly removed from them to get them to stop activating this part of the brain. Now, it turns out we don't need electrodes in people's brains to activate the nucleus accumbens. In fact, your nucleus accumbens is activated every single day with things like luxury goods, sex, certain chemicals, junk food, and of course, right there in the center, our technology. All of these things activate the very same part of the brain, your nucleus accumbens, all the time. Now, for decades, the psychology community believed that the purpose of the nucleus accumbens was to stimulate pleasure. Right? Why else would lab animals and later people incessantly activate this part of the brain if it wasn't because it felt good, right? Not exactly. What we now know that Old and Milner never did is that the nucleus accumbens does not stimulate pleasure per se, but instead activates what we call the stress of desire. The stress of desire. Let me show you why. Because what we now know through these fMRI studies is that the nucleus accumbens that you see here becomes most active in anticipation of the reward, right? But when we actually get the thing we want, the thing that's finally going to make us happy and finally make us feel good, that's when the nucleus accumbens becomes less active. So the way the brain gets us to act is not by stimulating pleasure. It stimulates this itch that we seek to scratch, this wanting reflex, which is literally painful to us, that we seek to extinguish. Now, it turns out that there is a way to supercharge this reflex. Did you know that I can teach you how to manufacture desire? Does anybody want to know how to manufacture desire? <laughs> I'm doing it to you right now. <laughs> so when I took that long pause, and I asked you a question, and I stopped talking for a second, I changed my cadence, I did something different. You perked up. Why did he stop talking? What's going on? What's he going to say? And it turns out that that bit of uncertainty, the unknown, is fascinating. It causes us to engage. It causes us to focus. And it is highly habit-forming. It's called a variable reward. This comes out of the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning back in the 1950s. Skinner took these pigeons, he put them in a little box, and he gave them a little disc to peck at. And every time this pigeon pecked at the disc, at first, they would receive a reward, a little food pellet. So peck at the disc, get a little reward. Terrific. Basically, Skinner could train his pigeons to peck at the disc whenever they were hungry. That's called operant conditioning. But then Skinner did something different. Skinner stopped giving the reward every time the pigeon pecked at the disc. 
and started giving it every once in a while. So sometime the pigeon would peck at the disc, no reward, no food pellet, nothing would come out. But the next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times that these pigeons peck at the disc increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Why does this happen? Because variable rewards spike activity in the nucleus accumbens, creating this desirous response. And so in all sorts of things that we find most engaging, the things that capture your attention and won't let go, you will find one or more of these three types of variable rewards. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. Now let me introduce these to you briefly. Rewards of the tribe are about social rewards. These are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, and come from other people. So the search for empathetic joy, feeling good because someone else feels good, competition, cooperation, all of these things use this reward of the tribe. Best example online is, of course, social media. Right? When you open up that Facebook app, you're never quite sure what you're going to see as you start scrolling through the, 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 the posts. Right? What did people post? What do the comments say? How many likes does something get? High degree of variability around what you might find when you engage with the social media site. The next type of variable reward is called the rewards of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt are all about the search for resources, material possessions, information. Right? These are things that, that, that stem from our primal need to hunt food and other resources. In modern society, we buy these things with money. So when many people think of variable rewards, they think about slot machines. Right? They think about that spinning casino uh, a slot machine wheel that nobody stops watching until it stops. It's very engaging because you're not sure what you might win when you play one of these games of chance. Interestingly enough, we see the exact same psychology at work online. Consider for a moment the feed. Have you noticed how everything online today has this feed? Why does everything have a feed today? Well, let's think about it. LinkedIn, for example, bought by Microsoft for what, $33 billion last year? Let's think about what, what makes the feed so powerful in this case. You open up the app. Maybe the first story is not that interesting. The second story is not that interesting. But maybe the third or fourth story is interesting. And what do you have to see? What, I'm sorry, what do you have to do to see more of those interesting stories? What do you have to do? Scroll. Scroll. And guess what? That scrolling and scrolling uses the exact same psychology as pulling on a slot machine. Both variable rewards of the hunt. Searching and searching for that next interesting bit of information. Rewards of the hunt. And finally, rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are things that feel good, that have this element of variability, but don't come from other people or material rewards. These are things that are intrinsically pleasurable in and of themselves. This is about the search for mastery, consistency, competency, control. Best example online is gameplay. Right? So when you play uh, Clash of Clans or Angry Birds or any number of these other online games, you're not necessarily playing them with anybody else. It's not about the social reward. You're not winning anything in terms of material possessions, but there's something fun about getting to the next level, the next accomplishment, the next achievement. And I know all of us are very serious business people. We don't play these games, right? But I bet you, you at least play this game every day. Does this look familiar, your email in inbox? Right? That unread message that you have to open, or the to-dos that you have to do every day, or the thing that gets me is that one app notification on my home screen that I just have to open to clear it away, are all examples of variable rewards of the self. The search for mastery, consistency, competency, control. Okay? So the point here is, I want to give you a word of warning, that variable rewards are not a free pass. That fundamentally, variable rewards are about scratching the user's itch, about giving them what they came for. And there has to be a match between the variable reward and the internal trigger. So if the internal trigger is boredom, well, then the variable reward must entertain. But if the internal trigger is something completely different, let's say loneliness, seeking connection, well, then the variable reward has to connect people together. Okay, there has to be a link there. Because the point of the variable reward is to give people what they came for, to scratch their itch, and yet leave this bit of mystery around what they might find the next time they engage with the product. Now, some products want to insert variability. 
other products operate in conditions of inherent variability and want to give the user greater agency and control. For example, Google doesn't want to insert variability. Okay? Because the process of looking for an answer, looking for something that you're searching for, is already variable. There's uncertainty there. Uber doesn't want to insert variability, right? Because the process of getting from point A to point B in a cab is inherently variable. You lack the control of knowing when you will get to where you're going on time. You remember, not so much in New York City because we have lots of cabs here, but everywhere else in the country, when you call the dispatcher, a taxi dispatcher, and you, this is how you know, everybody outside of New York where we have yellow cabs everywhere, when you call the dispatcher, and you say, OK, how long until I should go to the corner to meet my cab? The answer was always the same. The answer was always, eh, 15 minutes. Because the dispatcher had no clue, right? Maybe it was 30 minutes, maybe it was 45. They had no idea. So they say, eh, I stay on the corner in 15 minutes. Meanwhile, you're stressing out about whether you can get to where you're going on time. Well, here comes Uber with this Pac-Man-like interface. And they tell you exactly how far your, your driver is and how long it's going to uh, take to get you where you're going to go. So they've taken a situation that's inherently variable and given the user greater agency and control. Okay? Finally, the last step of the hook, the investment phase. The investment phase is where the user puts something into the product in anticipation of a future benefit. Okay? It's not about immediate gratification. That's what the action phase is for. The investment phase is about some future benefit. Now, the point of the investment phase is to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. And it does this in two ways. The first way is by loading the next trigger. By loading the next trigger. Let me explain what I mean. So when you send someone a message on WhatsApp or Slack or any number of other messaging services, there's no points. There's no badges. Nothing really happens when you send someone that message. What you're doing when you send someone that message is that you are investing in the platform, loading the next trigger, because you're likely to get a reply. And that reply, what's this meatball an example of? That's an example of an external trigger that prompts you through the hook once again. Not some piece of spammy marketing that you sent me, but something that I did that brings me back. That's loading the next trigger. The second thing that, exter I'm sorry, that investments do is that they store value. Now, this is a really big deal. Stored value is why I love working in technology companies as opposed to working in physical goods. Right? Physical goods, these chairs, uh, this podium, my clothing, everything in the physical world that's made out of atoms as opposed to bits depreciates. It loses value with use, with wear and tear. But think about this. The magical property of these digital products is that the more we use them, the better they get. They appreciate in value. That's a really big deal. So invest, the investment phase is all about the product getting better and better with use. For example, the more content I put into a service, for example, the more content I upload to my Google Drive, the better it becomes as my one and only cloud storage solution. The more data I give to a company, like Mint.com, a personal finance software, or Pinterest, for example, the more data I give these companies about myself, the better and better it becomes. In fact, think about it. If you log into my Pinterest account, it would be boring for you. There'd be nothing interesting there, right? Because it has been customized based on the preference data that I gave that company. The more followers somebody has on a site, the better the site becomes a way to reach their audience. So if tomorrow Twitter would say, hey, look, um, you're going to have to start paying for Twitter now. Twitter's no longer free. Okay? If you want to use Twitter, you have to pay us. Who's more likely to start paying Twitter? Is it going to be someone with 10 followers or 10,000 followers? Of course, it's going to be the person with 10,000 followers. Why? Because they stored all this value in the form of their follower count. It's a better way to reach their audience. And finally, reputation. Reputation is a form of stored value that users can literally take to the bank. Because on sites like Upwork or eBay or Airbnb, my reputation determines what I can charge for my goods and services. And how likely am I to leave one of these platforms after I've accrued all this positive reputation? Right? Not very likely. Even if a better product or service comes along. Now think about that for a minute. Even if a better product or service comes along. There's a myth that I want to kill right here and now. 
In the product design community, we are told that the best product wins. That's bullshit. It's not the best product that wins. Silicon Valley graveyards are full of companies that had the best technological solution. It is not the best product that wins. It's the product that captures the monopoly of the mind, the first to mind solution that we turn to with little or no conscious thought out of habit. That is the product that captures the market. Because it's through successive cycles through these hooks, trigger, action, reward, investment, this is how consumer preferences are shaped, how our tastes are formed, and how these habits take hold. So this is the most important slide of the presentation. If you're building a product that requires a habit, you've got to be able to answer, number one, what's the internal trigger that your product is addressing that occurs with sufficient frequency? Number two, what's the external trigger that prompts your user to action? Number three, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward? Is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And then finally, what's the bit of work done to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook? Now, before I take some questions, there's one more thing I'd like to discuss, and that is the morality of manipulation. So I know what that nervous laughter is about. Because I'm guessing that some of you, during my presentation, were thinking to yourself, you know, I don't know how I feel about this. this is, is this kosher? Is this all right to do to people to use their hidden psychology to influence their behavior? Is that all right to do? And if you had that thought, I say bravo. Because let's face it, anytime we are changing people's behavior to meet our commercial interests, that, my friends, is a form of manipulation. So we need to be very careful about how we apply these techniques. Because these products that we're building, these are the technologies that people take to bed with them every night. The first thing people reach for in the morning before they even say hello to their loved one, as an, as an, and as Ian Bogos told us, that our technologies could become the cigarettes of this century. So what responsibility do we have to use these technologies for good? How do we as product designers, as engineers, as venture capitalists, how do we put the psychology of behavioral design to help people live better lives? Well, I want to show you how I put my money where my mouth is. And I want to tell you about one particular company. You know, on my website, I, I do office hours. Every week, I do an hour of office hours in 15-minute increments. Anybody can call me for free. It doesn't cost anything. And a few years ago, a guy by the name of Glenn Moriarty called me. And he's a psychotherapist in Virginia Beach. And Glenn tells me that he read my book. And he knows that there is a problem that, it, that, that this hook can solve. And so he wants to run it by me. And he tells me, that the problem he wants to solve is that he knows that there are lots of people in his community that don't get the therapy they need. Right? They don't come in to see a therapist because it's expensive, it's time consuming, there's social stigma about psychotherapy, you name it. All those factors of ability are at play when it comes to getting the kind of psychotherapy that people need. So Glenn tells me his hook. And he says the internal trigger is loneliness. It's seeking connection. It's when a, a parent of a child with a disability or a soldier suffering from PTSD or just anybody who needs to connect with someone picks up the phone. The action is to open this app. And for no money, doesn't cost a dollar, doesn't cost anything, you are instantly connected to another person ready to listen. The variable reward is rewards of the tribe. There's somebody on the other end of the line that's ready and there for you. The investment, and here's where it gets really interesting, the investment phase of the hook is that the more you use seven cups, the more you are offered the opportunity to learn how to be a trained listener yourself. A third party study found that seven cups is as effective as traditional expensive psychotherapy. And this one app services 180,000 sessions every week. Talk about the amazing power of habit forming technologies to change people's lives for the better. And with that, I encourage you to build the change that you wish to see, fix one of the world's problems, to allow people to use these habits for good. Thank you very much. And I, have, I think we have plenty of time for questions. Before we do that, I have a quick favor. I have a little tradition. Can you uh, hold up your phones for me? Hold up your phones real high in the air for me. Hi, hi, hi. Terrific. The reason I ask that is for twofold. One, I like posting your photos on Instagram with such a beautiful crowd for my Instagram account. 
Second, the reason I asked you to hold up your phone is because I wanted to make it easier. Remember we talked about ability? I wanted to make it easier for you to take the intended behavior, which is to go to this URL, <laughs> www.opinion2.us. No, it's not .com. It's opinion2.us. And if you hold your phone horizontally, there's a very, very short survey. It's only five questions. I'm constantly looking for your feedback. I'm improving this presentation every time I, I give it based on your feedback. We'd love to know what you thought of the presentation. You can just take 30 seconds or so and let me know what you thought. The reward for filling out the presentation is that when you click Submit, you'll be given a SlideShare link to my SlideShare page where you can, see, where you can get all the slides I just showed you. Feel free to share those with your team or social media. Do whatever you like. Look for the presentation that says Hooked Model. That's the presentation I gave tonight. It's just scroll down a little bit on my SlideShare page. Hooked Model is the presentation. And with that, I would love to take some questions. Yes, there's one right here. Hello. Hi. Hi. My name is Leanne. Thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Um, so my question is more so around, you talked about different products. A lot of them were very much like utility products. Um, do you feel like a content or media site fits into this? So for example, like a BuzzFeed, does that follow the hooked concept and model? Absolutely. So I think that any, by the way, you get here, you get the first batch. I have little, little hook stickers for people's, if anybody wants these. So I'm going to pass these out. So you get the first one, if you don't mind just passing them out to anybody who likes. Um, absolutely. So I think uh, I talked earlier in the presentation about what do you do if your product is not used with sufficient frequency. Uh, and one of the strategies to bolt on a habit to a product that's not used very often is a content habit. So this is why content marketing is kind of having this renaissance right now. And a good case study uh, to exemplify this point is William Sonoma. Now, William Sonoma sells cookware, and they realized a few years ago, does anybody here work for William Sonoma by chance? No? OK. Um, they realized a few years ago that buying cookware is never going to be a habit. Right? It doesn't occur within a week's time or less. It's just not going to become a habit. So here's what they did. They started a content site called Taste. Taste has won all sorts of awards as being one of the best cooking-themed content sites on the web. Not, not corporate-owned content sites, just overall cooking sites you know, by, uh, that anybody owns. It's just so well produced. And two or three times a day, they're making this content that their you know, cooking enthusiasts are going to taste to, to f see what's going on, like new ideas, all sorts of interesting content. Why do they do that? Because they know this mantra that I want people to write down and put somewhere in your office, which is monetization is a result of engagement. Monetization is a result of engagement. We in the tech industry have been so focused on getting people to check out instead of getting them to check in. And that's what we should be focusing on. Because William Sonoma understands that if they can get people in the habit of consuming their content, guess who they're going to buy their dishware from, right? Who are they going to buy their cooking supplies from? Of course, it's going to be William Sonoma. So you can absolutely bolt on this content habit onto a product that's not used with sufficient frequency. Yeah, my pleasure. Good question. Please. Hi. Um, this is regarding. Thank you. Um, the question is on uh, habit forming, um, specifically with reference to the frequency you talked about the yeah. first week. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, be more specific. What do you mean? So you said that to um, make sure that there is a habit forming um, that happens in, right. in, in from a frequency perspective, it has to happen within the first week. Right. There you go. You get so, to have the first batch from the red ones. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the point is that um, there's a precipitous drop off in the likelihood that you will ever form a habit if the behavior doesn't occur within a week's time. That, that's really the point. So if your behavior occurs once or twice a year, forget it. It's not going to form a habit around that behavior. Right? These are things, the habits that we're talking about are habits like opening an app, checking a feed, playing a video, doing a search uh, in the enterprise space. By the way, the same rules apply in the enterprise space. I know I talked a lot about consumer web examples because these are examples that everybody knows. Everybody uses these type of products. The same exact rules apply. In fact, if you take that survey, there's another presentation uh, that I give to corporate groups that are working on enterprise products, and the presentation is called Hooked in the Enterprise. Same exact presentation all enterprise examples, companies like Salesforce uh, and Stack Overflow and GitHub, all of these products use the same exact model. It's not about enterprise versus consumer web. It's about frequent or infrequent. So if the product is not used within a week's time or less, don't even try and make a habit uh, out of that product, like insurance, right? Buying insurance ain't going to be a habit. What you can do is content, right? You can bolt on a content habit. 
The second thing you can bolt on is a community habit. Let me give you a, a case study here. Anybody here, by chance, a member of the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club? Anybody here remember that club? No? Somebody's grandparents in this room, I bet you are, because 300,000, did you hear that? 300,000 Americans are members of the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club. We're talking about Christmas ornaments here, right? That's a product that you would think people buy maybe once a year, right? However, if you go middle America to a Hallmark store in the middle of August, you will see members of this club lined out, lined up outside the Hallmark store. Why? Is it because of the ornaments? No. It's about the community. It's about people forming bonds with other enthusiasts of this product, right? So, in fact, one of, I know you're going to get very excited about this, one of the perks of joining the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club is that when they get new ornaments, you are invited to help them unpack the ornaments. I know. <laughs> Don't all join at once. But to members of the Hallmark Keepsake Ornament Club, that's actually a really big deal. Why? Because they get together and they see Gladys and they see Joe and they see Fred. It's about the community that they built around this product. Not the product itself, it's around the fact that psychologically human beings seek to understand and be understood by other people. That's what Hallmark is selling. It's not about the stupid ornaments, it's about social connection. So that's the two C's. If you have a product that's not used frequently, you bolt on content or you bolt on a community habit. I don't know where the mic is. <laughs> How are you going? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, what a truly wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thanks. Uh, are there things that can be learned from this approach methodology that can be used in advertising and marketing in terms of how you encourage people to go to a particular product? Yeah. Okay. Here, you get to have the blue one. Um, so this, you may not like what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, here's the thing. So uh, to change people's preferences and habits. For the past 100, 150 years or so, the way you did that was through display advertising, right? Mass media advertising leverages what psychologists call the mere exposure effect. The mere exposure effect says the more you see something, be it a logo, a brand name, a human being, the more you like them. It is no coincidence that in the 2016 presidential election, both candidates were names that the average American had seen thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times, right? Trump and Clinton were names that people were very familiar with. That is not a coincidence, right? So it doesn't matter if the other candidates were more qualified, they were familiar names, just as familiar as Coca-Cola and Geico, et cetera. So the way brands used to change consumer preferences and habits was being top of mind through display advertising, the mere exposure effect. Did anybody see that Super Bowl commercial that Facebook ran? How about that ad that's everywhere that Slack's doing? No? <laughs> what, what, what about uh, Instagram? The Instagram ad? The Snapchat ad? Yep. Where, where are the ads? You see it here and there. There's once in a while they experiment. But nowhere near the market capitalization percentage of what these companies are worth, they spend pittance on advertising. Almost no advertising. Why is that? Why do these huge, huge companies that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars spend almost nothing on advertising when companies of similar size spend billions on advertising. Because all of these companies that we mentioned, they don't change consumer preferences through the mere exposure effect. They change consumer preferences and habits through the experience itself. That's new, folks. That's different. The experience itself is what changes your habit. By running you through the hook, this is how habits are changed, not through the mere exposure effect. Which if, if you think about it, that's, that's amazing, right? They don't have to spend all that money. They don't have to waste all that money on, on, uh, on advertising. They get to keep all that, all that money because they don't need to spend on, on the advertising. They don't require the, the mere exposure effect. So the application of this is that if you really want to change consumer behavior in an age where people are carrying around these amazing devices, the way to do it is to change it through the experience itself by implementing hooks. You might pass it. You want to? Yeah, you can just pass it to whoever wants. Like three more questions. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, I've I been. Let's go. You're next. Oh, let's sorry. Her. 
Sure. Um, so thinking about uh, e-commerce sites, it's a little bit harder to pull in content because you're trying to keep everything as streamlined as possible. Um, I'm trying to think of different habit forming or rewarding um, features. I'm thinking about uh, tribal for reviews or comments on um, products. Are there other things that you think of uh, would fit into uh, hook from an e-commerce perspective? So from e-commerce perspective, the uh, the, it's content or community. Those are, those are the only two choices I know today. Uh, it's really content or community or Amazon. <laughs> but we, we yeah. right? but we all know, right? Like that's that's the elephant in the room. And it's fascinating how Amazon, uh, you know, by becoming the everything store, they they what I mean, talk about a product that a company that understands habit. I have to talk about if you mention e-commerce, I have to talk about Amazon for a second because they are geniuses of habits. I mean, it's come to the point where Amazon's competition is no longer Walmart. It used to be Walmart, right? Amazon versus Walmart. They don't give a shit about Walmart anymore. You know who's Amazon's competition today? The shopping list. Your shopping list is Amazon's competition. They want to make it easier for you to order than to write it down and risk you going out somewhere to buy it somewhere else. How do they do that? The dash button. I just got one of these things for free. The, I can't remember what it's called, the little wand thing. Have you yeah. seen it? This thing's amazing, right? They send this little uh, infrared thing. As soon as I run out of coffee, boop, it's in my cart, right? I tell Alexa, Alexa, order me more coffee. She knows exactly the kind of coffee I just ordered. Literally, they have taken on the habit of writing things down to remember to buy it later. They get, I remember, when the, do you know what the Amazon Dash button is? Have you seen this Dash button? I will tell you, the, does anybody remember the day that came out? I remember the day. It has a very auspicious date. April 1st is when that product came out. And I remember when that product came out, it's April Fool's Day. Everybody thought it was a fucking joke. Right? What a stupid invention. Put, you know, if I need more toilet paper, I just push this button. That's a, ah, that was a joke. It's not a joke. They understand exactly what they were doing. They wanted to make it easier for you to just push that button in order and then remembering to write it down. They get habit design to, to an nth degree. They really get it. They want to make it easier and easier and either to just order that product. So, uh, unfortunately, that puts a lot of other companies in a bind, uh, but I think the answer is content or community, right? It's finding your enthusiasts, it's building a, a community like Hallmark, it's creating a content uh, engine where people want to consume, uh, other enthusiasts want to consume the latest and greatest interesting stuff uh, around your product when it comes to interesting content. That's the best I got. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've been reading your book, and one of the things I realized that this was written, I don't know, a few years ago already, and I already feel that some of the examples, the landscape has changed. Mm. And I wanted to know what your perspective is on that, that given how much tech changes and how fast it changes, do you feel that any of the lessons you've learned are different in the years since you've written the book, or whether everything's just still the same? I think the fundamental uh, model is the same. I haven't seen anything that's invalidated the model. Uh, I think the examples, of course, have changed, right? So uh, some of the examples, uh, like I don't know if I talk about Amazon as much. I, Snapchat wasn't as big of a deal as it is today, so I don't think I mentioned Snapchat in the book. Um, so I didn't mention many enterprise examples. There's a lot more enterprise examples now than there were a few years ago. Um, so the fundamental model is exactly the same. Uh, I think you, know, you can find examples of the latest and greatest hot startup that people are talking about that, that use the model or don't use the model. So uh, this is a little bit of a specific question, but I was curious about your perspective on Google search. Uh, I guess specifically about intermittent variable rewards, because uh, as they obviously focus on, it's a really, really low impetus to get people to actually search. It's pretty, really, really easy. You know, it's very accessible. But they try to get people off-site very, very quickly. So I, ever, so I wondered if you ever thought about, well, what if they maybe changed the search results to be dependent on the time of day or, and actually try to create some intermittent variable rewards in how people search results change. Yeah, so I think the, the fact that you have this you know, cornucopia of results, uh, that's inherently variable, right? Is this what I'm looking for? Nope. Is this what I'm looking for? Nope. And so their job is to give greater agency and control, as we talked about earlier, in that process of not knowing where can I find the answer to what I'm looking for. By the way, it turns out to be an incredibly sticky habit. I, I talked earlier about how it's not the best product that wins. Uh, let me do a quick poll here just to, to kind of make my point. Raise your hand for me if you searched with Google in the past 24 hours. Who searched with Google? OK, look around the room. Now I want you to you can put your hands down. How many of you searched with Bing? Bing search. 
Okay, one. What? Microsoft employee? <laughs> one person. Okay, one person in the entire room. Search with Bing, the number two search engine, one person. Everybody else searches Google. Is it because Google's so much better? Is it because those geniuses in Mountain View, California, have just figured out the best algorithm in the world? Yes. No, actually no. <laughs> you may think so, but it turns out in third party studies, okay, it's not my study, other third party studies have shown people the search results of Google versus Bing, and all they do is strip out the branding so that people don't know which search results are whose. It's a 50 50 preference split. People literally can't tell the two apart. They're just as good. Did you know that Bing pays you? They are so desperate to get you to change your habit that they will literally pay you in points that are convertible to cash to get you to change your behavior. But you don't care. You don't do it. And this is why habits are so powerful. This is why the best product doesn't always win. Because once you have found, that's how I search. When I don't know something, I Google it. I don't even give a chance. Like You, you might actually love Bing. But you don't even try, right? Because you form this habit that instantaneously when I need something, I Google it. That's why the best product doesn't always win. It's the product that captures the monopoly of the mind. There's no reason that Google is the monopoly it is, that they own 86% of the search market, that only one person in this entire room has searched with Bing, everybody else searches Google. It's only purely habit. That's it. That's it. Maybe one more? Do we have time for one more? We'll do one more. Okay. So what you said, I think, is true. How do companies manage to um, lose people then? Like, okay. how does Google lose? Yeah, great right? question. OK, terrific question. I'm glad we're ending on this question. So uh, I think what your question is, is asking, OK, how do you break the competition's customer habit? Right? Let's say I'm Bing. What should Bing do in this case? How do you take on a company that has an entrenched habit? There are four ways to capture the competition's customer habit, four ways. The first way is faster hooks, faster hooks. If you can send someone through the four steps of trigger, action, reward, investment faster than your competition, that's one opportunity. Let me give you a case study here. Netflix versus Blockbuster. Now, Netflix today is on our TV sets, right? We deliver, they deliver movies uh, and content through the internet, right? That's how we look at it today. But everybody knows that's not how they started, right? How did Netflix first start? How did they beat Blockbuster? Yeah, they may remember those red envelopes, right? Why did that destroy Blockbuster? By the way, I don't know if you knew this, Netflix, or, uh, Netflix offered to sell itself to Blockbuster for $7 million at one point. Oh Biggest mistake maybe in business history. They, they didn't take that deal because they destroyed Blockbuster. Well, why? Blockbuster was a perfectly good business. How did Netflix decimate that habit? Well, let's look at the old habit. I get home from work. My internal trigger is fatigue. Right? I'm tired. I just want to chill out. I want to watch something. I want to watch a movie. Right? I want to alleviate that fatigue. I just want to veg for a little bit. If I feel like watching a movie, I've got to get in my car. I've got to go to the, the Blockbuster. I've got to see what movies they have available. I've got to wait in line. I've got to get out my membership card. I've got to pay for it. I've got to drive home. I've got to put it in my DVD player. Okay? That's the old way of doing it. Then comes Netflix. And remember what they used to do? They always sent you a movie. You would always have something ready to go, even if you didn't really like the movie, but it was always there. I come home from work in this scenario, and there on my kitchen counter is a red envelope with a DVD in it. All I have to do is take that DVD out, and I put it in the DVD player. That fatigue is gone. Now I'm entertained. Right? Why? Because I could run through the four steps of the hook so much faster than the old way of doing things. So the first way to capture the competition's habit is faster velocity through the hook. The second way to capture the competition's customer habit is greater frequency. Okay, so we talked about velocity, speed through the hook. Next is frequency. If you can be the company that gets people to engage with your product throughout the day, more often than the competition, that's the second way that you can capture the competition's habit. So for example, the, the, the case study here, uh, if you think about um, why, uh, why Facebook had to buy Instagram. I remember when Instagram was sold, uh, I, I used to live in Silicon Valley, and Instagram was sold for a billion dollars. We thought, oh my god, Zuckerberg's such an idiot, right? He's, Facebook's jumped the shark. A billion dollars for Instagram? What a moron. I can't believe he paid all that money. You know how much Instagram's worth today if you separate it from Facebook? There's a Wall Street bank that just figured out how much Instagram is worth on its own. It's not worth a billion. It's worth 33 billion today. 
right? Who had the last laugh there? Zuckerberg knew exactly what he was doing because Facebook was built as a desktop first product, right? It was something you did back in 2006 on your desktop because mobile penetration, this was before iPhone, right? So it wasn't something that people used on a mobile interface. Instagram was built on the mobile interface. So how often can I engage with Facebook, which I can only do on a desktop, versus Instagram on my mobile device? Much higher frequency. So it was a competitive threat to Zuckerberg's habit, and that's why he had to buy Instagram and why he tried to buy Snapchat unsuccessfully, because the frequency of the behavior was so much more often. Okay? So velocity through the hook, frequency through the hook. The third way is to make the reward more rewarding. If you can find a way to make that critical third step of the hook something that is better at scratching the user's itch, right, is more interesting, more exciting, a better solution to the company's problem or to the customer's problem, that's another opportunity. And by the way, it can't just be a little bit better. There was an HBR article that, that showed that it has to be nine times better. The reward has to be nine times better to get someone to switch just for the reward. And the final way that you can capture the customer's habit is easier entry into the hook. So if you think about how Office, Microsoft Office, lost to Google Docs. Microsoft Office used to be the most widely used enterprise software in the world. Today, if not, it's Google Docs. How did that happen? Well, when Google Docs first came out, it was pretty shitty. There's a lot of features you couldn't do with Google Docs that you could do with Microsoft Office, but it had a few amazing advantages. Number one, there was no software. It was all web-based. Right? So you didn't have to go find those disks and, and you know, have a disk drive and plug it in. Right? All that work was taken out. And number two, it was free. So if you're a college student, if you were uh, someone starting a new business and you just needed a word processor or uh, Excel, uh, like a worksheet type program, you could either go pay for Microsoft Office and install the software, or you could start using Google Docs right this second. So Google Docs won by giving gr easier entry into the hook in the first place. Now, of course, now Microsoft had to do the same. They had to match toe-to-toe, -to -toe, but that's how Google Docs got such, a, such a, 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 a foothold on the market. So to review, greater velocity, greater frequency, rewards more rewarding, and easier entry into the hook. That's how you capture the competition's customer habit. Okay? And with that, I'll be around. If you have any questions that I didn't get to, if, uh, if you don't feel like asking me today, you can go on my website, nearandfar.com. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but there's that tab that says schedule time with me. You can book time with me for free. We can chat about your business if you'd like at some other time. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Nir. So we just have a couple, of, a couple more quick things, and uh, then we'll be ready to do a little bit more fun. There's food, there's drinks, et cetera. So um, we have a raffle, so I know that you guys have your ticket. Hopefully you guys held on to it. Oh, well, you're going to miss out. So Shivan, the, uh, what do you call this again, the Sammy Slippers? Sammy Slippers. Uh, All right, Sammy Slippers. Okay, uh, do you wanna? Uh, do you wanna? To yeah, let's hit somebody to pick. You wanna call it out? Yeah. Okay, the number is zero four six five six eight. Who is that? Zero four six five six eight. Anyone? No? Okay. We'll, we'll pick another one. All right. Let's get somebody else to pick a winner. Okay. So this is 046574. All right. There you go. Thank you. Um, one more? By the way, just a, a story. These slippers are, even our employees don't get them. They are for our customers. And they're very, very comfortable. And they're the most coveted item in the office. All right, let's see. 046623. Anybody have that? All right, back there. There you go. All right. 
All right, thanks. Thank you. Um, so just like Nir, I have a, a little bit of a, a plug as well. So um, we love feedback. We're all product people, so we, we are constantly trying to make things better. Um, so the, uh, you should have received a survey already, an email. It's a super short survey. Please fill it out. We're constantly trying to make our programs better. It also helps our speakers get better. There's al it's almost like a, a mini contest. We Our, our NPS score, so it's, it's uh, typically at 50. Um, <laughs> um, and so last time with Chris, it was 60, which is fantastic. That's pretty high. And so we need to make sure that Nir beats that. So please take the survey. Make sure you do it uh, and provide Nir some wonderful feedback and for us as well to make things better. And then one more plug next, uh, next month, September 20th, our next speaker is Brent Twaretsky. He's the EVP of product at um, the EXO Group and he's gonna be talking about one of the uh, superpowers that a PM has, which is user science. I know. Um, we have time for our shout outs. It's just very, very quick. If you guys want to line up, if you have 10 seconds basically to share a product that you're working on, a job that you're hiring for, if you're looking for a job, anything that you want, please feel free. I can start it. I, like I said, I, I run product at One Kings Lane. I'm in product. We're looking for a director of product. We also have a lot of engineering roles that are open. Um, does anybody want to take the stage for 10 seconds? And this is, this is it. You get to do your say. All right. Ariel. <laughs> hey, guys. I'm Ariel. Um, I'm on product at Rent the Runway working on our subscription service. And we are hiring a ton of engineers, so especially back end. If anybody is interested, come find me by the booze and food. <laughs> what? Oh, and front end. Amanda needs front end. Very exciting. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, Betty. Let's go. Hi, everyone. I'm Betty. I work at Casper. Um, we're also hiring a lot of developers, specifically any front-end developers who are familiar with React and also React Native developers. So um, everything's on our job, casper.com slash jobs. Looking forward to seeing people apply. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Vlad, and I'm a co-founder at a company called Turtle. Uh, it's kind of like Upwork, except we have an entire process and software that actually makes it much easier to work with software developers. And then we handpick the exact developers that you need. Like if you need React, React Native devs, we take care of making sure that you have who you need. Price is really low. Um, so if you're looking for developers, then we just launched a partner program. So if you're a designer or a product manager or a CTO type that actually wants to manage the developers and be kind of a middleman or middlewoman uh, between customers and devs, we are starting that program as well. So talk to me after. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Well, thanks again for coming. Like I said, we have we have food. Near still here. Go talk to him. Um, thank you again so much. <laughs> definitely, definitely talk to him. Thanks again so much, Near, for coming. Thanks so much for Digital Ocean for hosting us. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys again next month. Just one quick plug: if you guys are eating, make sure when you're throwing out your trash, read the signs. We do recycle here, so. Do your bit to save the environment, guys. Thanks so much. <laughs>